Harold Pinter was in his early 20s and a jobbing actor in rep when he wrote his only novel, The Dwarfs. Existentialist in tone and autobiographical in content, The Dwarfs essentially holds key for the rest of Pinter's entire work, his poems, his plays, his films, indeed his entire philosophy. Pinter himself adapted The Dwarfs for the stage in the early 1960s and in doing so omitted the only female character, Virginia. In about 2000, Christopher Morahan, a regular Pinter collaborator, approached Kerry Lee Crabb and together they worked with Harold Pinter on a new theatrical adaptation which was then produced at the Tricycle Theatre and filmed by BBC Television. In uh, 2020, during the pandemic, the first lockdown, I was approached by actor Charlie McGeshen to stage a rehearsed reading, a live Zoom event uh, of The Dwarfs in order to raise money for a, a charity in Hackney. And it was during the rehearsals for that project that I interviewed Kerry Lee Crabb and asked him how The Dwarfs had happened and what he remembered about working with Harold Pinter. So tell me, when did you first when did you first meet Harold Pinter and what was that like? It must have been in my 20s and it was because we shared an agent, a guy called Jimmy Wax, Emmanuel Wax. And Jimmy, I think, fixed a lunch or something because um, he knew I admired his work. Um, and so I, I sort of connected with Harold then very nervously. I was a bit tongue-tied, as you are with heroes. Um, but then after that, sort of intermittently, um, I'd come across Harold because Jimmy started sending me his... sending Harold my work. Not all the time, but every so often. And Harold, being generous to young writers, um, would get in touch and say, let's have lunch and talk about this, and was terrific, um, helpful, you know. Um, what had you seen? Of, of Harold's. Oh, the very first bit of Harold's I saw was on TV late night, and I saw it with my dad, and we were just getting up, ready to go to bed, and it was a clip of Donald Pleasance and... Robert Shaw doing a bit of The Caretaker, and I even remember which bit it was. This is my dad who had no interest in drama at all. It was the bit about the jigsaw, right? And we both stood there with the, what I call the springtime for Hitler reaction. <laughs> we just going, what the fuck is this? Mm. And loving it, just talking about it endlessly afterwards. That was astonishing. And I went and to a local bookshop and got a script and mispronounced his name. I said, I think it's by somebody called Harold Pinter, <laughs> which Harold later told me was what one of his teachers had called him at school. Half Pint and Pinter. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, he published one of his early poems as Da, Pin da Pinter da, da or Pin Da Pinter. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, anyway, so I got the script and got to know it by heart pretty well. Um, and then later on started, when I was an undergraduate, doing, and I did a production of The Caretaker, and I was in a couple of his other plays, so sort of getting to know him from the inside. Loved it, because you end up, as you know, when you're working on them, you, you end up quoting him all the time, don't you? A whole <laughs> company of actors ends up, their entire lives get taken over with these bits of pinter. The music of it just gets in you somehow, um, and the humour. Um, so that was the sort of trajectory, and then bit by that, bit after that, through Jimmy, I got to know him personally, and um, as a sort of part-time mentor, um, and uh, great, I mean, he always made me laugh a great deal, um, a great deal and uh, that always helps. You, you said you, that you saw this little clip on, on the telly of Pleasance in The Caretaker. Yeah. What did you see in the theatre that, 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 uh, that, that you remember early, early on of Harold's? I think the first one I saw was, must have been The Homecoming. That 
colossal production of Peter Hall's with um, Ian Home and uh, um, Vivian and uh, who was Max? Paul Rogers um, and the great Terry Rigby mm. um, and uh, knockout, absolutely knockout evening and uh, yeah, smashing, smashing play um, the beginning of Harold actually sort of moving away from the street, the working class world and working class characters and beginning to get interested in the middle classes Teddy in that as the sort of educated one who's they've moved away and got a bit they've gone up a, a notch yeah and then comes back and everything fragments for it fantastic conception that play is um, I remember so it, an actor called Stephen Grive told me that, that when he went to see that he found the, the, the laughter the intensity of the audience laughter was frightening yeah. he, they, he thought something he thought the, the, the theatre might crack open or the roof might come off he'd never never experienced laughter like that in a in a theater sure and it, yes there's something very disturbing about it i think um quoting from the play almost half quoting from it i think it was harold hobson who said this play is a product of a diseased imagination <laughs> Do you remember that? and that that phrase a diseased imagination one of it like max i think uses that in the play of one of the others, um, but um, yeah, yeah. So that was stupendous and sort of life-changing. As you know, Francis Bacon, the painter, said that all our formative experiences happen between the ages of about eighteen and twenty-three, certainly in the arts, and I think that's about right. I remember seeing um, *Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf*, probably the same mm. year, and that. I thought it was pretty stupid. I think they were written, they were first done in the same year, I think. Yeah, they were close. Um, Uta Hagen and I uh, can't remember the guy now. Um, so, yeah, Homecoming. And uh, as I say, yeah, but I, then I think I knew them by doing them, by working on them. Um, and of course, there was also that amazing run of his film work. Mm. You know, again, it was sort of his left-hand work, his film stuff. But it, with Losey, he had a run of what I suppose are considered th at least three of the kind of top British movies of that decade. Hmm. A go-between and um, Accident. <clears throat> and also I loved, and indeed I've still got, the movie of The Caretaker with that astounding mm. cast, um, Alan Bates. I mean, I love the film of The Caretaker, and the BFI DVD has an astonishingly good uh, audio commentary track of Does Clive Donner and Michael Burkett and Alan Bates, I think, talking about how they shot it. It's glorious oh, right. stuff. Um, but the film that I often go back to and never tire of watching is The Pumpkin Eater, Oh, yeah, of uh, course. Which was pre Losey, but... Or maybe it was after The Servant. I guess The Servant came first, and then... It was Jack Clayton. It was Jack it? Clayton. Yeah. But, the, but that is an amazing screenplay. That is terrific. And that is probably sort of is it unique in Harold's work. And the, 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 it's centred on the woman. Oh, very much so. Uh, and she's fantastic in it, isn't she? Anne Bancroft. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, God, thanks for reminding me. I've got to have another look at that. No, it's it it, it it bears it bears. Uh, I mean, apart from the fact that the cast is is from the top top drawer. Peter Finch. Peter Finch, Anne Bancroft, Maggie Smith, and oh, James yeah. Mason, being creepy as yes, as, that's right. as, as hell. Being, being, yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's a it, Penelope Mortimer's novella. I mean, it's only a slim thing, but it's it's powerful. And and Harold absolutely understood. Um, the power of a story that, as you say, put a, a woman going through a tremendous crisis at yeah. the very centre yeah. of the film, and it and it still has that that daring and and um, feeling of of almost uh, it almost feels revolutionary actually. Yeah, that's a smasher, and and as you've mentioned, the, the servant, 
that I must have seen when it absolutely first came out and and loved. And again, what an amazing choice that was for Dirk Bogart. Yeah. Mind you, that was the phase of his career when he was making interesting choices. Mm-hmm. He was living in, the, in France and he was working with a lot of really good European directors mm-hmm. who were stretching him and stretching him, or he was stretching himself. Um, but he's unforgettable in that, I think. And James Fox and Sarah Miles. Yeah, good, good stuff, good work. Mm. It's a fantastic film career, mm. given that it wasn't where... Uh, Still, I think, under, undervalued um, in terms of Harold's, the breadth and depth of, of uh, I mean, you get these little, but then he, you know, he always made films, that they were adaptations of novels always. There's no film yep. that he originated from his own, uh, from himself, and they tend to be, relatively speaking, they tend to be, um, fairly intellectual properties, don't they? I mean, Accident is quite a strange little thing. Uh, I read yesterday that Sam Spiegel owned the, owned the rights to it, um, and uh, Losi and Pinter had to go and woo Sam Spiegel to get the rights off him. Um, that figures. But, it, but uh, yeah, you're right. And the go to L.P. Hartley was quite a, quite a rarefied sort of literary zone, wasn't he? Yes, represented by Jimmy. I wonder if Jimmy brought that about. Uh-huh. I think he might have just shown Harold the book. Um, so these made films. Harold cry apparently when uh, he first read it. I, I read that too. Not often, but I think Harold wept over a novel. But you reminded me of something that Harold said to me when I was I was doing some working on some film, development hell, as they say, and um, um, cussing about it. You know, and um, Harold, I remember saying, with his ruthless irony, you know, that glint in his eye, saying, "Well, you should, you should never." It was an original, that's right. He said, "You should never use your own ideas for films." He said, <laughs> said "Look at what I've done." He said, "But all the films I've ever done are from some other, some other bugger's work." Mm. You know, that's the way to handle it. Um, dead right. What did you know about the dwarfs prior to working on it and and approaching Harold? It was a fluke in that um, my dear friend Bonnie Greer from Chicago, um, who we were living together at the time, and she gave me the novel when it came out for Christmas, my birthday or something, um, knowing that I loved his work. Just said, there it is, the hardback. And I read it very mystified, very intrigued, and very glad that I had got to know it. And then, sort of as you do, I kind of forgot about it, went to the shelf. And then I suddenly got a call, either from Judy, our then mutual agent, or maybe from Chris Morahan, I can't remember which, saying, do you know? Harold's novel, The Dwarfs, not the play, the novel. And I said, yeah, funny enough, I do. And he or she said, would you be interested in working on it? Do you want to adapt it? And I said, like a shot, yeah, you bet. Um, And it happened from there. Christopher lined up the National Studio so we could don't like the word, but we could workshop it. I think we had a month before we were obliged to show anything to anybody. Of just, and we pretty much started with the novel, kind of marked up, and then went through that terrific process of saying, well, chapter three, first chunk of that, getting the actors up. And let's have a go at this. Let's see how it how it plays. You know, oh yeah, it goes a bit on there. We need to get the scissors in, but I think there's probably a scene there, isn't there? I think we've got a scene we can work on. And was Harold in the room at that point? Or? Not at all. So it's um, you and Christopher Moran and the actors. Harold was taking, as as Billington says in his book, a sort of kind of long distance paternal interest, but. 
Um, I think the real reason he wasn't there was because he was very ill. He'd been in and out of hospital with what finally killed him, uh, the cancer. Um, so he wasn't able to be around. But it was enough already because, as you know better than I, when you've got a room full of actors and a director and a so-called adapter all chucking in their tuppence worth, pushing and pulling something, it's quite difficult to get it crystallised and get it unified into a sort of a vision of the book. Um, there are still things now that I look at and I can remember exactly who dug their heels in and fought for certain passages, you know. Usually Chris Morrow, I have to say. Um, but you did say that Harold uh, chucked a few extra passages well, that, at you and said... Yes, that was another big surprise because I thought, and I remember saying to Chris Moran at the beginning, I reckon that we should be able to do this in 90 minutes. For its own good, I think it should be a 90 minute. And Chris either strategically or genuinely said, yep, yep, I think you're right. Um, but it did grow a bit, somewhat, an hour and three quarters, I guess. Um, but anyway, and then Harold joined quite late and was, in general, very disciplined and very encouraging, but trying to keep a bit of arm's length on it. But of course, inevitably, he got more and more kind of fascinated by his own text. And he said, he admitted, you know, he started off by saying to me, come on, you know this stuff much better than I do now. I haven't looked at it for years. But as he sat there listening to things, and he'd have the book by him, he'd suddenly go, and I've forgotten, I'd, I'd written this, <laughs> you've skipped here. You know, what are we going to do about this? So he started wanting to add certain bits, and I remember what his bits were too. So it kind of snowballed. What kind of stuff did he want to put back in then? Again, it surprised me a bit. He was very keen on, to use a sort of catch-all term, he, he was keen on the existentialism. Oh which I kind of took for granted. And I tended to think initially, well, a bit of this goes a long way. We know young men of whatever generation, but particularly men of that generation, they get a bit of Sartre and a bit of Camus in their bloodstream. And they like, you know, they, it's quite, um, it's quite narcotic stuff when you're that age and that stage. And it must have been for those boys then that immediate post-war generation. It must have been incredibly potent medicine. Um, there's a lot more of it in the novel. Explicit kind of discussion about the essence versus the other, you know. You think um, mostly drew, drawn from Sartre or, or other sources as well? That I'm not sure about, actually. Having, having mentioned Sartre and Camus, they were the big boys for me. Um, I think mm, didn't discuss it much with Harold. I did discuss a lot of the literary influences and one of the ones that I hadn't expected, which surprised me but then makes perfect sense when you get over the surprise, was he mentioned Hemingway. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly thought, yeah, Hemingway's short stories particularly and the dialogue. Mm. You look at the dialogue in The Killers, Mm. That famous short story, mm. and a lot of it reads like. Oh, it's it? wonderful! Yeah. It's stunning stuff, but it's. I mean, Harold learned a lot from that. So yeah. tell us, uh, Kerry, tell us about the dwarfs, and what exactly is it about? I think it's about something pretty universal uh, when you boil it down. And I sort of tried this out on Harold. At one rehearsal, I quoted that a bit of that poem of Larkin's called Sad Steps, I think, about getting up in the middle of the night. And the poet in it, Larkin, looks through the window and sees the moon. And it reminds him, he says, of the strength and pain of being young, that it can't come again but is for others undiminished somewhere. 
think I've got that pretty right. Anyway, I quoted this to Harold and he lit up. Mm. And the next day I got a copy of Harold's collection of his favourite um, Larkin poems. And that was one of the ones that he'd selected. Um, and he that registered for him. It is about youth. It's about that phase, which for most of us, the equivalent would have been the higher education, the college, the university phase. Very difficult to remember with these characters in the play, I think, that they're sort of self-educated. Well, they've got Hackney Grammar behind them obviously a superb school but they feel so like undergraduates graduates they're so fly um they're so clued up and well read um and all credit to them and i remember henry wolf saying that it was harold who led on that front harold was always the one who found the books the new writers the ones, you know, the new territory, that they all just, you know, his recommendation was kind of law, they'd all just devour whatever he was onto. Um, so it is about that, it's about leaving home, about leaving those close, sort of school-formed, study-formed friendships. Um, How old was Harold when he wrote the novel? That I'm not sure of. It's a very good question. Well, it must. Very young. I know it's before he wrote a play, so we know it's before sure. 1956. Sure. It must be when he when he was an, a rep actor in the early 50s, really. He'd started repping, and also he was he was quite a poet. He'd clocked up quite a lot of poetry. Don't think he'd published any, as far as I know. But he was a poet first and foremost, and I still think of him as a poet. I have to say. And he's a poetic dramatist in the best sense. Um, but he wrote poetry all through his school days. And I must check it out more. Maybe there was the odd small magazine that published the odd poem of his. But um, that's where his heart was before he became a dramatist. And then, as a transition, he tried this one novel. So he was very young, early 20s, as the characters in the play all are, I think. So how does it work to have a, a, a young writer writing about youth? What does, that, what does that feel like? Well, again, hats off to Harold. Amazing insight into what he's actually going through, or went through last year, or a couple of years behind him. Astonishing kind of nous and sophistication about what that, what the Americans would call a rite of passage. That story of those boys particularly, catalyzed by the young woman. But that phase of leaving home, starting the work world, the work-a-day world as it's called in the, in the play. And gradually, as we know, we discover at the end of the play, the whole kind of constellation splitting apart. Will those friendships survive? How long will they survive, if at all? Um, so it is about that, and I think that is a universal. Everybody can identify with that. And so youth, I think, is a huge chunk of what it's about. This is not fancy intellectual analysis, I know. And um, the other thing I think it's about, equally fundamental and universal, is it's about friendship. And these friendships that are dealt with in the play are as deep as any I know, I think, in the literary world. Again, considering the youth, the comparative youth of the, the people that are being depicted, they are so familiar with each other and they kind of I feel for years have given each other no quarter. They're not, the friendships aren't indulgences. Somebody said very cruelly that English friendship isn't worth much because it's untested. And I kind of feel that for this post-war generation, 
plus the um, the Jewish tradition of disputation. Mm. Um, with these characters, I feel I would be frightened to be part of that group. <laughs> I think I would like to think I would get the hang of the way they cut and thrust and fence and stitch each other up verbally. But it is a very abrasive, tough, witty, but it's a, it's, you go through the rigour with these boys, these young men. Um, they won't let each other off the hook. Anything that feels indulgent or intellectually lazy or emotionally sloppy, they won't buy it from each other. And there's something very exhilarating about that. There's something very exhilarating about their mutual exchanges, their discourse, their way of being together. Uh, but it's pretty ruthless. And certainly at the end of the great duel, as I think of it, at the end between Mark, the pinter figure, as one can't resist thinking of him, and Pete, uh, that huge kind of sustained showdown is a tough, tough thing mm. for two young men to put each other through. Isn't it? Am I wrong? No, no, it's 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 extraordinary. I mean, it's a it is a kind of duel, a sort of showdown, a kind of reckoning, um, and the the monologues go on for pages, um, and yet they are paired back to a a, a Pinteresque essence, and they they express the most extraordinarily crystalline focused feelings about one another. Yes, they focus on the other guy yeah. all the way through. Here's your trouble. I'm going to tell yeah. you. Are you ready? Here I come. Yeah. Both barrels. Duck it. Yeah. And they, the other guy stands there and says, yeah, fire. fire. I'm yeah. ready. I'm yeah. ready. Do your worst. It's the shootout at the old car. Uh, the shootout at the old car. Uh, at the OK Corral. Corral. <laughs> Isn't it? It's fabulous. Fabulous. What, what, I love that scene. What is the plot of the dwarfs? To me, it's, uh, again, this is, this is, distilled to its essence for me it's uh, <laughs> very close constellation of male friendships catalyzed and disrupted by this other planet of the female character the female The Jungian, I can't remember what Jung calls it. It's anima. The anima, the anima. The, 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 the feminine one. component of the male, yeah. sa the masculine psyche. Here she comes and she passes through this constellation. And they all kind of love her, who wouldn't? Um, but she moves from one of the men to another and doesn't stick around long with him, as far as we can tell. And to me, it's like that whole... It's like the Beatles with the Yoko coming through, or happened to any band, pretty much any band, when you get to... Male band. Yeah, when you get to the point where you have a serious relationship with a serious young woman, that whole boys town number is severely put through the ringer. Mm -hmm. It's heavily revised, and quite often it's sidelined. The energy shared. gets re rerouted. Yeah, and it has to be. It has to be. There is a kind of tragicomic inevitably about uh, inevitability about it. It's not tragic ultimately because that's where life resides. That's how life has to go on with that female principle. Mm. But boy, she is disruptive in this and. Incredibly touching. I don't, for me, I don't feel she means to disrupt. I don't think there's, she's calculating it. I don't think she's getting a kick out of watching the impact she has on them. Um, no, she's in, an, uh, she's in what we would think of as an abusive relationship. Yeah. She's got the, the, the salt and bile of Pete in spades sometimes, and she's astonishingly tolerant of it. Um, but, but we meet them as that's coming to to the end of its natural life, don't we? Yep. Yep. 
I always think it's so interesting, whether, whether it's a novel or, or, or a play of Harold's, we only meet these characters at the point where an audience or, or a, a reader or, or an observer can play a, a useful part as a witness to the moment where it all falls apart or, or where it must change. Yep. The, yeah. the, 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 what do the Greeks call it? Kairos, the propitious moment. Yes. Where you can act. And if you don't act, you, you might regret it. And that's a massive impact in, for me in Pinter's work because, as somebody said, it may have been Stoppard, that Pinter sort of only exists in the present. And that's, I think, part of what, how he reinvents the atmosphere between the work, the play, the piece, the artefact and the art spectator, the audience. Mm. There's something unique to me about the way he makes the air crackle. Mm. You're kind of on, mm. not you as an audience member. Mm. As you watch him, as you listen, you're sort of implicated, you're on very thin ice. Everything is kind of full of little, to me, full of electric shocks and weirdnesses. But that thing, that, that abusive thing in Pete, I mean, it's extraordinary that it's the book. He's non-Jewish. He's the non-Jewish one of the boys. But it's the book that he attacks her with. First of all, through Hamlet, uh, because he's embarrassed by what she says about it. Which is, that is deliberately provocative, I think, what she says. But then, he actually turns books into weapons. He throws a heap of books at her <laughs> in public, in the park, or on the way to the park. It's a kind of bruising thing to do. It's violent. Yeah, it could, it could actually do some serious damage. Um, but they sort of, just thanks to her, they sort of survive, half survive for a bit, just about survive for a bit longer, as people do. So go back to my to my thought about how would one crystallise the plot because you got you got oh, sidetracked gosh. there. Once upon a time. So it's a but you started with it's about a a group of young men who are distracted by the presence of a woman or or whose unity collapses. But actually, what is the plot of the of the what is the plot of the dwarfs? That's a tough one. I know. <laughs> that is a tough one. That's why I'm asking. But as you mention it, and because I haven't got a ready answer, but I'm I'm sort of monitoring through very rapidly in my head his other work. I mean, the caretaker. I couldn't tell you what the plot is about. And there's these two brothers. One of them takes in a one takes a in tramp. a tramp, and they fall out, and then the, mm -hmm. the tramp leaves. I mean. It sort of runs through your fingers, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and ditto with the dwarves. I mean, you, these three lads, I'm tempted to say, because they are lads to me now. Um, they're embarking on their adult lives. One's got an ongoing relationship. You see, already I feel like I'm boring for England <laughs> about it. You know, that, that's the trouble with plots. Isn't it? I mean, the Americans, when they talk about films, they always say, you know, it's the plot and the plot points that are crucial. I've never known anybody leave a cinema talking about plots. It's, it's a... It, I think it's atmosphere, it's character. I don't know, Harry, you've got to do this one. Well, I think you, you said it when Googly you... Googly back at you. When you... <laughs> it's a, it, it is a... You said rite of passage, and I think it, it absolutely is a rite of passage piece uh, about a group of friends, and uh, they're beginning to, to enter the, the adult world of work and career and relationships, and uh, one of them falls for one of the other one's girls, and the group breaks up. Um, but, but, I mean, that's how I'd say it, I suppose. But does he fall for the other one's girl? Well, of course, one says that to make it sound like a plot. But <laughs> yes, to, yes, to, yes, to sort of condense and make it, make it sort of assimilable. But as soon as you say it, you think, well, 
Is that what Mark's up to? Is he genuinely thinking I'm falling for this girl, or is he say, I think he's up to another game? Um, I, I, my own feeling is he doesn't know what he's up to because he's as unconscious as the others are, and that's the, that's the rite of passage. That, but by having experiences, they are going to become more self-knowing. But they, but we we witness them going through formative experiences. Exactly, and I think this is where we get up against the nature of drama and the way it's usually analysed when people talk about in Stanislavskian terms about objectives and super objectives and all that and um, the method, you know, what do you want, what's your intention in the scene and everything. But actually in real life, as Martin Amos said, you know, motiv- if you look at actual human behaviour, motivation is insanely overrated. You know? we're, we're none of us conscious of what we want or what our objective is. Most of the time, most days. We get very rare glimpses of it sometimes. You think, I want that woman, I want that job. Mm. But most of the time, you, you sort of find out either as you're doing it or you find out after the event. Exactly, exactly. Oh, oh so that's what I was doing. That's who I am. Exactly. But it is something about that. Um, and I, th- I think that, for me, that connects with what I mean about if it was Stoppard saying it, he, maybe it wasn't Stoppard. But that thing about Harold existing, Harold's work existing, in the present, mm. that his writing method, the little he said about it, is that he gets this sort of sense of people moving about in space and he watches and listens and tries to sort of make notes on it as it goes along, as it unfolds for him. Mm. Um, I think that the Stoppard quote I was looking for, which is fun, is, um, I may have said this to you before, Harry, but insight was that before Pinto everything that happened on a stage as an audience you were obliged to believe otherwise why were you there you know with Pinto <laughs> you can't believe any of it if somebody says oh, I've just taken a walk around the River Lee you immediately think did he is that what he was up to? <laughs> really? Is that what was going on? Or is he saying that? Is he just saying it? You know? And if so, what is his game? I don't know. It's very like cricket as well, too, isn't it? The dialogue that works in a very cri- cricket-esque way. Um, the way somebody bowls and then somebody... Yeah, the way that someone defends it. their wicket um, against a, an onslaught of variety. The, the the fast Yorker, the, the, the googly, the the one that goes the on with the arm. The third party. <laughs> and then there's a pause. Yeah. Everybody kind of Absolutely. It and takes a different sight like Wonderful. Beautiful. It's made of so many things. Can I ask a question uh, about the um the earlier version? Because there was an earlier version of the dwarfs as a play which Harold did very very early on. Yes. Um which significantly omits the presence of Virginia. Virginia, yes. And did you ever talk to Harold about about Virginia's presence or absence? Yeah, um, uh, and Harold was um, surprising, as he so often was. Um, I think it was Christopher Morahan, I think it must have been, who, when he read the book, thought of the one-act play and said, well, isn't it funny that that one act, Harold chose to omit Virginia altogether? Anyway, when it came up, what I remember Harold saying is, yes, that was a big mistake. And I think it probably is, because I don't think that, interesting as it is, it's kind of like a fragment, the one-act version of The Dwarfs. And it isn't just because I now know the the novel. Um, I think when I first read it, and saw it done, it felt like a sort of splinter of something. And it, yes, it, it didn't feel quite complete for me. And I think it is, a, it is a loss not to have Virginia. I can sort of see why he did it, because Christ knows there's plenty enough going on between the three guys. But it does, now, it's very, it does feel a bit like a, a leg of the bed is missing. Mm. 
Um, so it's it's greatly enriched by her. I certainly feel. So wh- when you put her back in, how did Harold how did Harold respond? Very happy, I think. I think that was a big part of the interest for him. Um, apart from as he <laughs> discovered as we went along in the rehearsals, you know, that there was quite a lot of stuff in the book that he'd simply forgotten and suddenly went, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, this is this is something. I, you know, I like this. Um, but I think the the fact of having that young woman in there that is probably the major change, isn't it? That is the major change. It's a complete rebalancing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Everything else is kind of it's it's the fellows and bringing in more dimensions of that and more facets of their characters. But the big thing is having the girl. It's, once you know that, once you've read the book and she's a part of it, it's very difficult to think of it without her. I haven't seen the one-act dwarf since. I haven't read it, actually. I did read it at the time to see if there was anything in it that was transposable. Mm. I don't think there was. I don't think there was. Do you, have you ever felt there's, that there is... Um an element of homoeroticism about the the boys' friendships and uh, that, that that's conscious on Harold's part, or do you think it, that we project that onto it? If indeed we do, I think there probably is, because I think with young men that's always latent. Um, there's always that, you know, having a fight on the ground, which is partly a way of getting physically close even if you're thumping the daylights out of each other. What, a touch of the D.H. Lawrence's? Yeah, kind of, yeah, that, absolutely. Um, and so I think, it, I think it hovers a little bit and I think, I think it's, it, it works several ways. I mean, I think Len, who is a bit like the sort of He's the Chico Marx, is that he plays very well with Pete and he plays very well with Mark. And he kind of wants to be loved by both of them, accepted by both of them. And actually they're more interested in each other. Um, Or at least they are when we meet them. Yeah, sure. Um, But he seems to get short shrift and he seems to get shoved about a bit. Get me some bread and honey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I want a cocoa. Um, but he manages, Len manages to make himself the centre of attention, doesn't he? He gets ill. Not half. He, 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 yes. he breaks down, he's got visions, he's having delusions, he's maybe schizophrenic. He's, he's got a lot He goes to Paris, him. he has a, yeah. bra- a, a gastric episode because of some cheese. He's got a lot. He's got <laughs> music. He's got a fantastic head on his shoulders. He's got a very interesting mind. Um, he's got great humour. Um, yeah, he's a wonderful geezer altogether Um, but I think um, that sparring, that fencing that goes on between Pete and Mark has a homoerotic feel to it intermittently become my favourite word today I think it flickers and then ducks into the shadows again but it is true, I mean if you fence with someone if you literally fence with rapiers I remember a, a fight director on a Hamlet, funnily enough, that I was involved with, who just got hold of Hamlet and Laertes, and they'd learnt so many moves and so many, you know, so much choreography. And he just said, you can sort of ease up on all that, let's forget that. He said, when you're doing this duel, he said, the important thing is the eyes. Never take your eyes off each other. If you if the duel is happening there, the audience will totally believe it. Mm. And certainly to see that put into action, I thought, yeah, that's a bullseye for me. That's really worth remembering. Um, and I think it's that kind of that kind of love, um, competitiveness that goes on between. Um, all the three young men but I think it reaches maybe 
a sort of it's getting towards some sort of climacteric when they get very drunk together mm -hmm. and that again is a way for men to break down the repressions and the barriers isn't it that you can yeah. put an arm around each other yeah. and prop each other up and lean on something together and all of that can go on and I think there is that running through that part of their friendship their complex friendship and it can't quite be born in those terms by them they're neither of them gay enough or unrepressed enough mm -hmm. to follow that through to its source and so it's worked through somehow in that explosion mm. that, that happens with Virginia. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying she's in any sense a substitute. Uh, although there's that odd thing of early on about Pete saying, you're more of a boy to me than a girl. <laughs> so you sort of think, hello, Pete? Yeah. What are we into here? Um, and she must think, oh, for goodness sake. I can't put up with this much longer. But again, it's one of those things that I think the plays, the text is so rich. And I can say that because it's Harold's, not mine. It is so rich that with any given bit of it, my sense always, and it was when we did it before, is let's not make a meal of this. Because there's so many other things threaded, mm -hmm. so many other beads, you know, that we have to account for. So many other colours um, to kind of pack in quite rapidly that if you suddenly, as Nicholas de Jong did in his review, remember, of the first production of it, he made a bit of a thing of the, the homophilia, I think he called it. And I think, as you said, I think that was him projecting more than an honest reading of what was there. Um, but it's there, but it, you know, it's certainly, it's in the subtext but then you start, once you get it under the floorboards and start looking around at the subtext, there is no end to it, <laughs> is there? I mean, that's a many-chambered space. Yeah, yeah. There is so much. Subterranea. There. Yeah. There's so much there about me. And often the, that's the, the land that Harold would say the, the author has no further information well, about. What, yes. But what did he say about Freud? You know, the wet dream world. He <laughs> said in another place, we've got absolutely no time for it at all. No, not at all. And I, th I, think, I think it's certainly true that some things, they resist analysis because analysis turns into prose, something that is essentially poetic. Mm. Or metaphorical. So, yeah, yeah. And, and we don't sort of... There's no big gains there for that. It's one of the things I think is most remarkable about Harold, <clears throat> thinking about him as I do quite a lot, that, um, you know, for someone who never studied psychology or even mythology particularly, his natural innate understanding of the multi-layered universe or, uh, yep. you know, uh, you know what I'm probing at. I mean, his, his, his total acceptance of that uh, is, 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 is extraordinary in a, in, a, in a writer. His faith in something that he can't articulate but nevertheless insists on being on, on its presence and, and interacting with it. He's got a lot of it by osmosis. He's soaked a lot in him and I think he could read probably, uh, you know, one of Freud's things about dreams and get much more out of it than I could reading the whole book. You know? I'm not convinced um, he ever did read any any. Uh, no, I'm not because Freud or even any Jung. I don't think he read any Jung particularly. I think I mean what, what we've got to go by. We've got his conversation and his work, and what he said about his work, which is he's certainly in, and in conversation in work. You know when you did that documentary about him at work. Um, he, he wouldn't be drawn famously by an actor asking certain questions because I think it's that sense of which is not unique amongst poets or creative people that you don't want to shine a light on something that exists 
that thrives in the shadows. Um, why would you want to do that? It might just evaporate, it might scurry away into the wainscoting, it might just, just you know, it might elude you altogether. And the very title of The Dwarfs, Harold Pinter's The Dwarfs, adapted by Kerry Lee Crabb, but there are no dwarfs in this play. Not a dwarf so to be seen. What, tell us why, tell us who the dwarfs are and, and uh, what will people make, people who've never heard this play before or, or see, seen it, what will they make of the title and, and, and its uh, presence in, through, through the play? You might hate this, but you know, when you live with it for as long as I did, you do start figuring things. Um, despite what we just said, but don't, don't go there. Um, the dwarfs are, they seem to be a, a, an invention, a sort of dark, sometimes comic, sometimes terrifying fantasy riff, series of riffs of Lens. When he's alone, he seems to go into this world of the dwarfs. There was sometimes sort of company for him, other times they're, they're, they're warnings, they're quite, they're scary. Um, but there are times when his riffs about his imaginary dwarfs, they seem to chime, they're in parallel with what's actually happening with the other guys and with himself. The very last one, for instance, when Mark and Pete have had their big showdown and it seems like it's curtains on that relationship. That the last riff about the dwarfs that Len comes out with is very much about the circus leaving town. It's kind of everything's pa being packed up mm. and tucked away. Something's finished. And a sort of barrenness is left behind. And so, for that reason, I suppose, and this may be very corny, but I sort of think of the dwarfs as Len's slightly defensive, self-protective way of thinking about himself and the others, the other males, that he sort of, he deals with them and himself by kind of saying, we've got to grow up. It's the, it's the right right of passage again. We've literally got to we've got to be bigger than this. We've got to outgrow the the routines and the patter and the familiar gags. Um, he's had such a strange it must have been very tormenting for him, I always think. He's gone through such a strange trajectory in terms of his working life. He obviously needs to work. And he, he's, he lists them at one point, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. he's, mm -hmm. At the time the play begins, he's working at Euston Station, night shift at, at Euston. And he's done a string of weird things. He's been a stagehand, interesting. But most of the things he's done have been very menial very sort of um, blue collar, not stimulating. Walk on parts yeah. in life. And not, not intellect, nothing he can use his intelligence on. And you feel like Len hasn't found his metier yet. He hasn't found his outlet for his extraordinariness, which I feel is there. And I feel it with Pete as well. Pete hasn't, and he's working in some office in the city, isn't he? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Looking at the girls Crunching numbers. sandwiches at lunchtime, so he's frustrated as well. I feel with Pete, you sort of think, or I sort of feel, it is a bit sh shaded by what one has found out about the actual people that have some relation to what's on the page. Um, I always feel like Pete may never find it. He, never, he might never find his thing, as we would have said in the 60s. Len, you feel, I feel Len would never have given up until he found it. Mm. He would in a very dedicated way. 
he'd have found his niche in society and would have given what he's got to give. Pete, I always feel as well, he seems to be fragmenting during the course of the play mm. and the novel. And I often wonder, does he ever get it all back together? Does he ever recover? Do you think in that sense that Len and Pete perhaps switch positions as the, as the story goes through, that Pete begins the play feeling like he's got it all together and he's ready and Len's fragmented and by the end of the play, Len's a bit more put back together and Pete's Very interesting. Yeah. breaking up. I think you're right. I mean, I hadn't thought of that before. I've never seen it quite like that, but I thought that rings very true to me. It would certainly be very Pinteresque. Yes. I mean, he hated the word, but, you know, we know what we mean by that. And it certainly feels like the Pete that I know early on in the show, that Pete, even if he was feeling shaky and flaky, he'd put up a front, he'd strut, you know, he'd bluff for a bit. Um... Well, like most young men, he finds v emotional vulnerability intolerable, doesn't he? Yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll bugger about with you rather than feel his own authentic... Um, and that's what catches up with emotion. him. Emotion. Something, something gets him. But there's a boulder rolling towards him that he can't dodge, and he, and he gets it in the neck somewhere down by the canal. Something comes unravelled for mm. him. I tend to think, I mean, I'm real hard reading of that section of the novel, I do get the feeling that he tries to drown himself. Or at least see what it would feel like. Yes, dare on it. Hmm. I said, yeah, the sort of images that we played with in the rehearsals in the, in the National Studio was him kind of, you know, sort of holding on to something and leaning towards the water and getting the head, then mm. the face in, and then to un disengaging one hand and going further in, getting the whole head down, and then not quite, you know, the knuckles won't quite let go. Mm. And him coming up again thinking, shit, I'm still alive, I mm. can't do it. Um, that feels like what he sort of takes into that, that next scene with Len. Um, he's had intimation of mortality uh, but like so much it's open to any one of a number of interpretations isn't it uh, well I do think that, that there is a strong sense of in, in the terms of the title uh, the dwarfs as well as the general atmosphere between them that these are young guys who and, and Virginia too the young people who are trying to put down roots in a time where that's really difficult psychologically emotionally uh, dealing with reality bombed out London um, I mean I wonder whether we're having a slight parallel moment now you know with the world changing out of our grip out of our grasp and young people looking at it saying but this isn't what we were this isn't what we signed up for the center cannot hold and certainly something that Harold said somewhere or he may have written in a short piece. Is, no, I think he said it. I think he said it in relation to this, this text. He said, he said it was unbelievable that we'd had five years of, you know, the, the Third Reich trying to bomb the guts out of us. You get through that, um, being a, uh, you know, he was sent to the country, wasn't he? Hated it. Um, but he said, you get, you get through that five years of being bombed, bombed to smithereens. And he said, and, and then they start something called the Cold War on you. These nuclear weapons, you know, that all that suddenly. So you, there, there was nowhere to turn. There was no point you could relax and say, well, we're through it. The, the, the shit stopped flying for a moment and you realise there's bigger shit around, potentially. They must have felt so vulnerable, particularly the, the Jews, particularly the, the, the Mark and, and Len, you know, to, to be that age and to grow up with that knowledge. You know, people trying to 
wipe out your entire being um, on an industrial scale. Presumably they went, you know, they would have gone to a cinema in Hackney and watched those newsreels. And that was pretty bloody sobering, I bet. One of the threads that runs through the play is a relationship that has turned or is turning in front of us violent, psychologically violent and physically violent, both emotionally violent. And it's very accurate, I think, about what it does to the young woman and how she copes the best she can with it. But also appallingly, unnervingly accurate about what it does to the man uh, who is who is creating the violence and is himself a victim of it because he can't control it. What do you think, Harold? What were Harold's feelings about male violence towards women? He would never say in a, in a, in a play, I think we should disapprove of something, but... Um, Harold is sometimes accused of misogyny, sometimes accused of, of writing uh, women characters who, who are patriarchally subjugated. But I must say women actors in Pinter don't seem to feel that. What's your sense of Pinter's approach to women? I think he's created some terrific women. I think uh, Ruth in The, in the Homecoming is as astonishing. I mean, even in the most contemporary feminist terms, she's the most self-defined, self-fulfilled, self-willed, um, self-mastered creature. I mean, she upends an entire family of men. Um, literally. I mean, they all wind up on their backs, kind of baying, you know, helplessly at her. Um, She's astonishing. I think Harold is writing very often, let's not remember, let's not forget, rather, about women of a particular period and also within a particular social context. And we all know that we tend to skew our notions of misogyny if we're part of the sort of literate, liberal, um, North London-ish set, we kind of expect and encourage our women to be liberated in inverted commas. But the reason that they drive towards their own self-actualization and libera liberation as hard as some of them do is because the vast majority of women are still fighting that fight. Virginia, in this particular story, play, um, is a young woman teacher embarking on her career, um, probably more established as a worker, as a member of society than the three young men that she's dealing with. She brings to all of them, I think, in amazing forbearance and tolerance, um, is equally deft at dealing with all of them, and they are hugely different. Um, but Yes, she does fall into some of the traditional functions and roles of women of the 1950s. She makes the tea. Um, she sometimes doesn't answer back when she's provoked, but it's part of her part of her nature, the, the good part of her nature, that she doesn't think that, as any more than I would, that fighting with these guys is that there's not a percentage in it, because they squabble amongst themselves, that it's, a lot of it is about each other, jostling for precedence rather than being personal to her. Um, I think but the play doesn't. sees her liberating herself from, from oppression. It turns out, yeah, that her for all the moves she makes on the chessboard, that bit by bit she seems to escape those traditional 1950s bonds and becomes kind of transcendent, I feel, by the end. Kind of escapes the bonds of all of it, you know? Um, but uh, a lot of his women are good parts, 
just looking at it from that point of view. Hence they're good, interesting characters of depth and com complexity and contradiction. You know, inner conflict isn't as important as external conflict in any drama. Um, but Harold is hugely interested in the male-female axis, what goes on between men and women. And once again, he x-rays it. He doesn't take any prisoners with it. He says and would defend it on the grounds of, well, this is how it is. You know, and if you pretend it's different, then you're kind of kidding yourself. In an ideal world, perhaps it should be different. But, you know, certainly in the 1950s, we had a bit of discussion of, of it in relation to the dwarfs when he was around. And he'd say, well, yeah, I mean, I could change it for contemporary, you know, fashionable taste. But why? He said, this is how it was for Virginia. This is mm. how it was for young women then. Um, is, he a, is he a feminist? Is Harold Pinter a feminist? I wouldn't go that far. But I wouldn't go that far because I don't think he's in anything ist. You know, it's like he said very precisely at one stage when people were trying to pin his work down. He said, well, he said, I think what I do is realistic. But he said, but I wouldn't call it realism. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think he added, and I wouldn't call me a realist. And I know what he means, he didn't want the labels. Mm. Because one minute, as we know, I mean, in this text, one minute it is photographically realist, and other moments in Lenz monologues, it takes off into yeah, sort of um, the most modern 1950s jazz. It becomes bebop and it's, it's way off, you know, what we would normally think of as realism, naturalism. It's, uh, you know, it's on its own, it's walking in its own air. Um, if you looked at it today, the dwarfs and lens circumstances today people might say well he's suffering from bipolar disorder or from from mild schizophrenia that do you think that that harold regarded the mental health aspect of len as a as a, as a serious condition or 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 was it simply that he was disturbed because of the time and and the way life was I personally think it's more interesting to look at the second, look at it the second way around, and it's partly because I think what what all the sort of labels and interpretations along those lines do, I know they're useful, um, but I think what they do is that they're interested, they're categorising, they they're useful in terms of finding out what things and certain things and certain people have in common. But actually what most art is interested in is how different everything and everybody is. So I never heard Harold say bipolar about any of his characters, actually. I never heard him use that terminology. I think he was free of all those, so, you know, that sort of psychological jargon. It's better than jargon at its best. but. I think what he might say, this is Dicey talking on behalf of him, but I, I think he might just say what Len is up against is what the other guys are up against in the play. He's trying to grow up and he's just come out of war and he's Jewish and he's, actually what Marx would say, I think he might identify with that, he's doing alienating labour all bloody night mm -hmm. um, and he's got a fantastic head on his shoulders he wants to read and think and play music and go to the festival hall you know on the few shillings he's got and he feels very thwarted you know it's a sort of uh, R.D. Lang view actually you know? it's a, all these things are socially um, created rather than some psychological syndrome uh, He's in, a, he's in an extreme conundrum 
that is sort of squashing and bending him out of shape at the moment. We've all been through that, particularly at that kind of age. Um, but with Mark's return from working out of town, it, it, it's now right in his face in terms of the two, two lads who he's most fond of and most attached to, beginning to want to take lumps out of each other. Yes, and Mark is interesting because he's, he has sort of found his feet, hasn't he? Yeah. He's got his flash suit. He's got a persona and now. And he's doing the acting and he's doing a bit of, he's starting out as a writer. He's just trying his paces there a bit. And he's found something endlessly fascinating and rewarding to do. And he's had a few birds and yep. a few drinks. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. He's not a virgin by any means. <laughs> and he's, yes, he's getting good at it. And also one suspect he's getting, a, he's getting to be a handy actor. Uh, mm. So that's a lot mm. in your early 20s, isn't it? It certainly marks him as different when he comes home. He's going to have a different feel, a different outlook. They're going to perceive him differently. They might be jealous, they might be he's resentful. Cool, isn't he? He's very cool. Yeah. He's very cool. He's a cool one, isn't he? And he's keeping, he's keeping his counsel when it pleases him to, to not say what he's thinking and feeling. Yep. Yes, he's learnt that. He's learnt that. That, you know, if it, Lee said soon as, uh, yes, Lee said, Lee's mended. Oh, soon as mended, yeah. Yeah, that, that, uh, and also that you can, the less you say, the more people project on you. <laughs> and you, and you might find out what they really think. Yes, yeah. Mm. So last year, Jamie Lloyd put on 20 of Harold's plays in the West End, uh, and a whole new young audience came in to see those and were switched on to, to Harold and his characters and his weird, wonderful, mysterious world. But The Dwarfs wasn't included. What, what do you think a young audience can get from The Dwarfs? I think they could get a lot, um, but I understand it not being part of that. And I also understand its strange sort of um, satellite position in Pinter's sort of work because this adaptation of it which I think does work maybe better than the little fragment of the one act version but this it's not Pinter it's not quite the echt Pinter that people the aficionados understandably want you know, I want, of course, too. But the young people don't know what that is, so they come they to this very, know, very know, unformed. And, uh, I just wonder whether the dwarfs can can speak to them in some way. I think it, I think it could, and I think it it needs. I mean, I think, thank Christ, Harold's stature is undiminished. He's not, as they say, dated. That hasn't happened to him, and I don't sometimes see it. I don't see it happening. I don't see any danger of it yet. Um, but I, I think I thought, in a state of sort of slightly heady optimism, after we'd sort of got the first version on the stage, I thought, I think maybe young company or a drama school will kind of pick up on this. I think I might be seeing young actors working on this because of everything they'll get from it and I think young audiences will share what they get from it and I think it'll have a little life. And that hasn't quite happened. You may be able to create it. You may be in the process of creating it. Um, it was done after the national version, the, the tricycle version, the TV version, which is a lot, mustn't be too greedy, but it was, I think I mentioned to you, it was once done by a very young gang in Lithuania, of all places. And I got a call saying, you know, do you want to go out to Lithuania and have a kibitz, you know? And of course, yeah jumped at it and it was a very strange experience because a friend of mine 
Shane Connerton had had a play done in Poland a bit before this and he said beware he said mine he said I didn't recognise my play at all he said for a start it was in Polish but he said they did it entirely on trapezes he said they were on trapezes all the way through so they were out of breath and they kept sort of falling off things but um, <laughs> but he didn't say that to me before I arrived but what I was confronted with and it was I didn't see a rehearsal I think they must have known that potentially I might have been in trouble. And I did wonder what would Harold do in my shoes, you know. I felt sort of very much in, in Harold's, um, in his honour, being there and being responsible for it. But they only let me in for the first night. I didn't see any rehearsal, so it all came at me. <coughs> and it was the, the rubber um, boxing match. It was every theatrical cliche of the last... 35 years. These guys appeared naked in white face and white body makeup with bowler hats and trombones. There was a TV on stage, you know, with a sort of a camera somewhere picking up on bits of what they did. There was no Virginia, except at one point a, a woman's pair of feet appeared on this television screen and even with my absolute minus knowledge of Lithuania, I could tell that what they'd done with the text was they had raided it for a few little bits that they fancied. They hadn't done the play at all. That was not what they were in business for. They'd taken a few little, little teeny fragments and then it sort of slung them up in the... I think they probably just put them on bits of paper and slung them on and left them in the boxing ring during rehearsals and said, well, if in doubt, you know, put the trombone down, pick up one of these and say what's on it. So it was this completely sort of random thing. And I sat the entire thing thinking, what the hell must be turning in his grave? What do I do about it? But then I thought, there were two sides to Harold. There was the one who marched into Café La Mama where he'd seen posters for what he was, one of his plays when he was in New York for some other reason. And La Mama was doing it, apparently, and he knew nothing about it. So he went marching off to La Mama, and of course everybody said, well, she's in there, you know, in the, behind the office door, and he got storming in. And there was lovely woman, what's her name? Um, lovely big mama, uh, black, big black mama who ran the place on a shoestring. And anyway, Harold disappeared into the going, Oh, I've never been so and so. Slam. Mumble, 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 mumble. Came out with La Mama about half an hour later saying, Absolutely understand. At any time you want, you know, free rights on any of my work, you only need to say the word. Just lift the phone. Yours. You know, so she was magic. That one. She had voodoo on her side. <laughs> and she completely... And I thought there was that side. And also there was the side where... Jimmy told me that uh, Harold would fight tooth and nail on films about a comma. But then uh, Jimmy said he's now reached the state where he just says, it's not worth it. It's a film. It's the director's game, you know. Just save your energy for a play or whatever. I think he always defended the text of his plays, but he did become more yielding and very generous towards the young and this little outfit in Lithuania. Shoestring Productions, Lithuania. They were bright young sparks. They just hadn't got the right sort of clue to have it. They didn't know how to tackle a pinter. And I don't really know why they bothered with the text, because what they wanted was the dressing up box and the tricks and wheezes, you know. And uh, the, the circus. The circus of it all, you know. Um, I've done a bit of juggling, can I work that in? You know? <laughs> and I did, I spent a lovely night with them. Stayed up all night saying, you know, sort of understand where you're coming from, but you really should have. You would learn much more if you got a hold of a text like this and tried to measure yourselves against it rather than dodging all the demands it makes and doing something else instead, which is really what you've done. I know. 
and of course I still believe that. But we are very text-based here. Very. And there are parts of Central and Eastern Europe and there are places like Lithuania where they don't have a, a dramatic heritage. But I'm sure if they had a poet playwright, he would or she would prefer them to do what's you, been yes. crafted and honed You'd think, on the at, page. But at the same time, if they've run, <laughs> if they've run their theatre for generations without having a solid, you know, national treasure trove of textual material to draw on, then you're sort of lumbered with the dressing up box, aren't you? You, sort of, you know, you get all these geezers that come out of these places that sometimes they they get a bit of a they they get a bit of a crack of the whip here. Um, people say, "Oh, he's Polish. He's very trendy. You know, he'll get you all dressed up as chickens, and it'll be great. You know, trust him." <laughs> and occasionally, somebody it's could incredible. Cross, cross, yeah. yeah, sometimes it's fantastic. I mean, the poor theatre, that, that Polish guy. Um, Grotowski. That was interesting. Oh, and the Living Theatre, that was the American outfit I was trying to think of the name of. Scandalous that I should forget that name. The Living Theatre, who started in the attic of their house. To this house here, you could have three theatres running here. <laughs> God's sake. Well, I've just watched this amazing documentary on Netflix about uh, Wynne Handman, who founded the... Um, American Place Theatre in New York, which I'd never heard of, but sounds like it was an absolute hotbed of, of revolution and creativity, but um, almost forgotten now until I'd seen this, this wonderful film. Theatre's a bit like religion, isn't it? It sort of flares up briefly for a moment and suddenly the action is there and, then it, and cinema's like that as well. Why is now the time to put on a reading of The Dwarfs what's its X factor, its inspirational quality, what are people going to remember about it, what, what's going to set them alight? There are parallels with what's happening now in terms of the psyche for the young particularly. It's a young piece of work, it's about the young, uh, it's funny, it's edgy, it's astonishingly unusual. If you haven't read the novel you've got to get to grips with this piece of work because it is the absolute root of Harold Pinter. Everything else came after this and out of it in a strange kind of way. All the notes that he played are somewhere there as he gradually gets to grips with what's possible in terms of getting character and language moving and it's a very utterly unique piece of work altogether. It's 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 its own creature, as Bob Dylan would say. It walks by itself. <laughs> Last thing, mm. what did it mean to you to do this with Harold? Oh, it's a phenomenal treat. I mean, that's one of the moments where my luck seemed to be inordinate. To be asked by him, because he had to have obviously, in the end, he had to say, well, yeah. That's the guy I'm trusting this with. God knows why he did, but he did. Um, to be handed it and to be given, really, freedom, you know, till the last minute with it, um, was one of the great working experiences of my life. In fact, go further, it was one of the great experiences because time spent with Harold was always gold dust. And... and I will always hope to be one of those many people who will keep his memory alive and his torch shining as strongly as it ever did because he was one of the few and far between, as he would say. <laughs> great man, mm -hmm. great artist and a great, great, uh, a great sense of humour, which is the best bonus ever. So what's it like for you taking it on? I, I haven't had my go yet. That's true, you're um, teeing up. Working with this lad who's playing Mark has been a great training for what's to come, what we've got to try and achieve in a week, because he's asked all the questions and it's been incredibly rich to, to talk about it with him and um, 
it's just rich. You just get into the hinterland of it and there's a lot there. Uh, and it's just like any other wonderful play. You discover the whole thing, even if you felt you knew it or you've done it before or whatever, but it's, it's phenomenal. It's the best stuff to work on in, in the canon. And he and they are bringing the sensibility and experience of exact contemporaries of the people in the play. Yeah. And your, your, your 50s, did you say? I can't 58. believe that. 58. But they're bringing this new wave of energy and thinking and feeling to it. Yeah. Absolutely appropriate. It it's is. Theirs, isn't it? it is. And that's the great thing about the play is you've got to have young people. You've got yeah. to have, you can't have people pretending to be 10 years younger. Sure. You need them, you need intelligent, bright, hungry young people who, who are fearless. That was one of the strange things about the one act version is it was always done with older actors. I think that may have muted it. Uh, well, if you've ever seen it, there's a, you know, Guy Veeson kept a diary of the rehearsals in 63 of the dwarfs mm. and they're all absolutely flummoxed by it yes and harold has to make various you know statements of of kind of clarification and uh, has to teach them how to play it he says you know it's, mu it's, it's sitting around like this for an hour talking about a single line is going to drive us nuts folks it's much much better just to just to take a risk commit to the line see if you can find a rhythm and just give it everything you've got he knew that. He's an actor. But, but actors love to, um, you know, intellectualise. They do, but also they love doing his material, don't mm. they? Yeah, yeah. Yes, no. They they talk about ducks to water. I've never known an actor who didn't just go... Whoa. No, and I've never known a writer like, like Harold, maybe Shakespeare, but mm. the, the way young people respond, because ever since he died, that's all I've done, is, is bring Harold to younger people through various uh, institutions and... I've never met anyone who, who they start off going, oh, it's all very well, this Harold Pinter, or, or um, you know, I think he's sexist, or but, but whatever they think at the beginning, yeah. it's a once you're in that world of Pinterland, you, you, you never want to leave. Oh, she's reminded me of so many things there. Uh, Jimmy telling me, is that Harold's not interested in money, he's not interested in travel. Um, he said the only thing he's done since he became famous and, you know, got a reputation is uh, he, he organised to meet up with Samuel Beckett one night in Paris and they spent the whole night walking around the streets in bar crawling. Really. God, wouldn't it have been wonderful to be a fly on the wall for that one? <laughs> Well, Harold um, passed out, apparently, and Sam had to go and buy him, find some um, Alka-Seltzer. But that line, you know, that goes through from Harold through Sam, both Nobel laureates, mm -hmm. and then beyond that through Sam to Joyce, mm -hmm. and Harold apparently, every night before he went to sleep, he read part of um, Ulysses. Yeah. He just kept on and by. And, and I've always thought it was interesting that through the other line of Losi, because Harold adored Losey and yeah. viewed him as a father figure, but Losey assisted Brecht. Yes, that's right. On, um, that's right. Um, on the Galileo in, in Los Rome. Angeles. Yep. So yep. Harold's on the receiving end of a, of a, a pincer movement from modernism yep. that goes Brecht, Losey, Joyce, Pinter, Joyce Beckett. And that's an amazing uh, kind of bunch of influences to be bringing, bringing with you. Yeah, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so that gives them a wonderful place in the landscape. Doesn't when they when they say uh, when they say you know Shakespeare couldn't possibly have written Shakespeare's plays, I always say, well, in that case, nor could Harold Pinter. How does the the only son of a Jewish tailor with no, no books in the house with snobbism and uh, both those comments and with it? grandparents who didn't speak English, how does that man end up winning the Nobel Prize for Literature? Clearly, Harold Pinter's plays were oh, written by Kerry Lee. The snobbery. <laughs> I know. Appalling, and it's like it's like fucking. Virginia Woolf, may she crown. Um, <laughs> you know, talking about James Joyce and saying, oh, he's such a peasant. <laughs> you know? I mean, she ripped off all his, his tunes. Lousy tart. Um, <laughs> but, but that thing about Harold and, you know, going through every line and actors asking the questions, it reminds me so much of Nora Barnacle. <laughs> um, talking about her hubby, the late great Jimmy. 
And she said, the thing about Jimmy, she said, is um, when he explains something to you, it leaves you none the wiser. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's perfect mm. to me. That's perfect. That, that um, chambermaid from Galway, to whom he was utterly devoted from the moment he clapped eyes on And that comment just gets him in one for me. Um, but yes, we can't do it. Oh, God, I mean, if you ever suffer through a university, so much interpretation and scholar, scholarly comment and commentary. Oh, it's just a waste of trees. Well, here's what I really think. This has been lunch. really good, and we should have some lunch. <laughs> and Kerry, great. thank you very, very, thank you very so much. Thank very much. you. Bless you. Bless All right, you. I'll cut the cameras.